glad to be with you this morning. Well, after this week's events, how applicable are the Proverbs for us today? Those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law strive with them. Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand all things. Proverbs 28, verses 4 and 5. The understanding spoken of here comes only from God and is to be chosen above silver and gold. Let's begin our worship this morning with a hymn. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me because he is my right hand. I will not be shaken. Psalm 16, 7 and 8. We're here this morning to hear the counsel of the Lord, to set the Lord before us for the study of his word and the instruction in it. So we are glad to be here this morning to do that. A few announcements. We are still fine-tuning the reopening of the chapel. I want to uh, encourage everybody to be patient. A lot of thought in, uh, is going into that decision how we do it. So hopefully we'll have more information on that very soon. As a reminder, following our lesson this morning, we will be observing the Lord's Supper, so please uh, take a minute to prepare those elements. Also, continue to pray for those that have asked for prayer requests, especially now, uh, as ever, we should be constantly in prayer and giving thanks for what the Lord has done for us. Well, as I said, we're glad that you're here with us this morning. Now Dan will come up and read our scripture reading for this morning. Dan. Thank you, Seth, and good morning to all of you out there and to the three of you here. Another week of um, online church, which is a little bit of an oxymoron. But we're thankful that we can do this and thankful for the technology and uh, appreciate the men that have been facilitating all of that. We are in Second Peter. We're in chapter 2. This is the third lesson in chapter 2, and we pick up in the middle of verse 10. Peter has been describing false teachers. He continues with that, describing them as daring, self-willed. They do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. Whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed, suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong. They counter the pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you. I'm going to comment briefly on that in the lesson, but carouse is probably better translated as feasting with you. Having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his own transgression, for a mute donkey, speaking with a voice of a man, restrained the madness of the prophet." May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time in it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. The Proverbs tell us that a, as a person thinks in his heart, so he is. That truth is on vivid display in our passage this morning, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 10 through 16. From verse 1 of chapter 2, Peter, Peter's subject has been false teachers. He has given their heresy. He has 
warned of their judgment. Now he completes his portrait by describing their character. Peter doesn't mince his words. One commentator called this a colorfully expressed tirade. That's a little strong, but reading it did remind me of Luther, who's notorious for the style he used against opponents. He attacked them with insults and crude language. They did the same. 16th century was a rough age. We don't do that today. Really, we are the opposite. Theological discourse is polite and conducted in a irenic spirit. That's the expression often used. Irenic being one that promotes peace, cooperation, not Luther and not the apostle. Peter wasn't crude, but he was forceful. He took the gloves off, so to speak. But he did so under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He called the heretics animals, stains and blemishes, and accursed children. Not out of personal animus, though no doubt he was angry. These were and are shameful people. So the descriptions may be colorful, but they're appropriate. These men destroyed souls, just as they do today. They are skilled hunters, man hunters. Peter describes them as trained. They, they are skilled in their tactics and objectives. All of this is a warning. This is what false doctrine produces. Paul gave some warnings to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20. I think I've read that more than once just in the past few weeks. But there he told them to guard themselves and the flock. Wolves would inevitably arise in their midst. And we can expect the same. So while the passage may not be pretty or comforting, it is necessary. It's like the skull and crossbones on a bottle of poison. And that means we need to pay attention. And we need to pay attention carefully to what Peter says. He's already described these people in verse 10 as men who indulge the flesh and despise authority. He now gives a further description that can be summarized in the single expression, self-centered. Putting it mildly, they are ravenous for three things, money, praise, and pleasure. Peter described them as daring, not daring in a noble sense, but in a reckless way. They are brazen, they're shameless in their attempts to exalt themselves. They're arrogant men. They are egotistical men. They are self-willed, Peter says. They revile angelic majesties, and don't tremble when they do it. They're so confident of themselves, so uh, full of themselves. Now, the word actually isn't angels. The word is glories. You probably have that uh, in the margin in the side of your Bibles. So it is subject to interpretation, but since this is used in Jude 8, same word, with a clear reference to angels, it seems to me and to most students, commentators, that that is the likely meaning. They revile angels, glorious beings, powerful beings. How they did that isn't said. It may be that they simply denied their existence. The descriptions that are given of these false teachers suggest that they were probably materialists, that they denied the spiritual, they denied the judgment to come. We see that clearly in chapter 3. And here they mocked the very idea of angels, maybe somewhat like the Sadducees who didn't believe in the spiritual, who were materialists, who didn't believe in angels. Well, it's what people do today. I think these 
ancient false teachers are very contemporary. They're very modern. The Bible today, for, for at least for those materialists today, is filled with inconvenient truths, truths of both uh, doctrinal and, and an ethical nature, truths that deal with our behavior. And what do people do that, uh, that don't want to hear that, don't want to believe that? Well, they deal with it very simply by rejecting the Bible and mocking the Bible. William James was a 19th century psychologist who made, I think, a perceptive statement. He said, a great many people think they are thinking when they are merely rearranging their prejudices. Rejection of the gospel is not due to reason. That is, it's not due to a preponderance of proof. It's not due to clear thinking. It's due to prejudice. And that was these false teachers. And their, their conceit is highlighted by the fact that angels who are far greater, far more powerful than these teachers are, they don't even do that. That's what Peter says in verse 11. Not even the angels themselves bring a, re a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. And the them that he's referring to is other angels, speaking specifically, I believe, of the fallen angels, of the demons. And the reason for saying that is Jude speaks very, of the same thing. He, he states that Michael the archangel, while disputing with Satan about the body of Moses, did not pronounce against the devil a railing judgment. All he would do is say, the Lord rebuke you, which showed his, Michael's, humility. While these men mock, either mock the angels directly or they mock the very idea of angels. Uh, either they claimed authority over the angels or over the scriptures, over the Bible, by denying the teaching of angels that's found in it, mocking the very idea of them, as well as mocking the fundamentals of the faith that are found in scripture. It's an expression of their pride, their arrogance. In verse 12, Peter compares them to irrational animals whose thought and conduct are governed by natural desire, by instinct, like wild beasts. Lions are powerful animals, but they live by instinct. They are genetically programmed to respond in certain ways. Their, their choices are irrational. Well, I shouldn't say irrational, but they're not rational choices. They're, they act on impulse. They live to eat. That's their goal. So while a hunter could not wrestle a lion into a cage, he could trap him with a piece of red meat because the unreasoning creature will smell the bait and follow his instinct into the trap. It's driven by a, a desire for food. And that's fine in the animal world. Lions are made that way. In fact, Peter might have said, my apologies to the animals for the comparison. They're meant to live like that. Men aren't. But these men do. Instead of knowing God and following Him, they follow their desires. They're governed by their appetites like wild beasts. And their desires draw them to their ruin. That's what Peter says will happen to them. Lust destroys like the unreasoning animals that are captured in traps, these men are trapped in their sins and destroyed. When I was a boy, the family took a trip to Los Angeles. First time that I had been to the West Coast, first time I'd seen the Pacific Ocean. And one of the sites that we visited was the La Brea Tar Pits. I was fascinated with it and wanted to see it. They are natural pits full of tar that were covered with leaves or water. The bones of a lot of ancient animals have been found there. Mammoths, 
saber-toothed tigers and others. They came to the pit to drink the water, which was on the surface, and in doing that, they became trapped in the tar below. Unable to get free, they died. Their thirst, their desire, led them to a sticky death. Well, that was these men. Peter said, like unreasoning animals, they will also be destroyed. They followed their desires in, into behavior that stuck to them, enslaved them, so that they became trapped in passions that destroyed them, body and soul. In verse 13, Peter says of them that they are suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong. That expression, suffering wrong, has the idea of being defrauded. So the thought is, in the end, they get cheated of the prize that they cheated to get. The, the pleasures that they were seeking eluded them and eventually ruined them. Now that can happen in any number of ways. Through, through their sin, they may ruin their health. Or through their sin, they may destroy their minds. Certainly sin it, it scars the soul of an individual and it affects the character and twists it. And of course, it wrecks their reputations. Paul tells us in Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. That is a law every bit as fixed in the universe as the law of gravity. There are consequences for bad decisions, for bad choices, doctrinally and morally. But also, the fact is, sin is a cheat. It is so enticing. It, it makes promises, but it doesn't deliver. Maybe that's part of what's behind Paul's statement, do not be deceived. Sin is deceiving. Lust, for example, is never satisfied. Can never be ultimately satisfied. And still, these men, they give themselves to it, and they give themselves to it with reckless abandon. Peter says they revel in the daytime. Now that's unusual. Nighttime is the time for, for, for revelry. Most people have at least some sense of shame and try to hide what they do under the cover of darkness, but not these. They play around the clock. They are stains and blemishes, Peter says, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you. Now, I commented on that in the reading of the text. I think a better translation for that is while they feast with you. That's really what the word means. It's uh, used in, here and in, in, in Jude in the same way. And so the reference is probably to the love feast, that is the, the meal that preceded or accompanied the Lord's Supper. This then is a, a situation maybe similar to that which happened in Corinth, you remember, in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul corrects the Corinthians for their abuse of that uh, supper. And some were enjoying a little too much wine, and others were eating most of the food before the poor saints got there. They were abusing it. Uh, well, that seems to be the case here, at least the venue for what Peter is talking about. By pretending to be Christians, these men use that holy occasion to take advantage of people. Saints are to be spotless. That's what sanctification is producing now in the believer in Jesus Christ. Not perfection, of course, but it is the process, a lifelong process, of transforming us, of removing the spots. It's what our hope of the glorious world to come, what our hope in the Lord's return motivates us to be. That's what Peter will say in chapter 3, verse 14, where he takes up the subject of the Lord's return. 
And he makes the point that it is a very practical doctrine because as we consider it, it does give us a sense of uh, urgency to live a life of obedience and a life that is one of righteousness. But these men reject that. They reject the whole notion of the Lord's return. They had no sense of urgency. In fact, they had no fear of God at all. They are spots and stains and blemishes. Without any evidence of sanctification, without any evidence of new life in them. Peter's condemnation of them gets specific in his description of verse 14. They are lustful men. He describes them as having eyes full of adultery. And the idea you know, is just that, that they, their eyes are filled with adultery. But literally, Peter says, their eyes are full of an adulteress. Now, that doesn't change the meaning, but does give the charge more, make it a little more concrete. That is why, that's how they look at women, is what he's saying. They're always calculating. They're always scheming to, to charm for their own purposes. And Peter says they never cease from this. One commentator put it bluntly. They lust after every girl they see. It's a, a bit crude maybe, but that's the sense of it. They, they never cease, Peter says. They can't stop. Sin is enslaving, like that tar in the pit. It sticks. So there, there is a sense in which sin is its own punishment. It gains power over a person. Now, that, that is a terrible condition. Because these people are in bondage to a life that is untrustworthy, which is unsatisfactory, and that, can't, that they can't stop. They have no self-control. But that's not so much Peter's point as it is that they are relentless in their pursuits. And their victims are of a certain type. Unstable souls. That's who they entice. The word, unsta the word entice literally means to catch with bait. It's used of fishing, and it's a, a, an appropriate term for Peter to use, being an old fisherman. That's how he pictures these men, only, only they are trolling the church for their catch. No church is immune from such people. They're predators. They come to places like this. And their victims are easy prey because they are unstable. They're not mature in the faith. They're not well grounded. They're spiritually weak. The best defense against heretics and spiritual hedonists and, and their seduction spiritually and morally is the Word of God knowing the doctrines of the faith, knowing the instruction on the, the life we're to live, and walking with Christ. But because the, the naive don't have minds that are trained in wisdom, they do not have the discernment to recognize the, the lies of those who are trained in deception and greed. Now that's how the false teachers are described, they, they are trained in this. The, the word that's used is gymnazo, and we get our English word gymnasium from it. I think it gives some color to the, the description that he gives here. They have worked at this. They have trained themselves in this. Over time, through experience, they have learned the art of seduction. They're smooth. That they know what to say to win people's confidence and get what is not theirs. It's a pathetic picture that Peter paints here. No ironic spirit here. But his language is not excessive and his language is not mean-spirited. It, it, it is accurate. He calls them accursed 
children. Luther would have applauded that. But these are the facts. Their character and conduct exposes what they are. They are under a curse, under God's wrath, and apart from repentance, they're doomed to eternal judgment, hellfire. Only the power of the cross can deliver them or deliver anyone. It is by faith in Christ that we crucify the flesh and then spend the rest of our lives doing that. That's Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. He crucified our old self when He was crucified. Killed it at the cross. Redemption was accomplished there. It is applied in time, and in each generation, in the new birth. And at that moment, with regeneration, being born again, and believing, at that moment, we appropriate what Christ did in our salvation. That is now our position with the Lord and our condition in this world. The, the, the flesh has been crucified. We're not the people we once were. Now, sin is still in us. We still deal with that. We see that in Galatians 5 and in Romans 7. It's very clear, if not from experience, from the Word of God. But by the power of the Spirit, we are able to keep that sin from reigning over us and not obeying its lusts. We deal with that in a struggle, as I say, and it's never complete and we're never perfect this side of heaven, but we have ability to do that. Killing sin is within our ability and it is an ongoing struggle. But these men are not in that struggle because these men are not joined to Christ. They haven't believed and they don't have a new nature. They don't have the Holy Spirit, so they are enslaved to the lusts and the desires of their heart and are under God's curse. And the fault is all theirs. Uh, they can blame no one for their condition but themselves. Peter puts all the blame on them in verse 15 where he explains their condition, he explains why they are people under God's curse. They have forsaken the right way, he says, which is the straight way, literally. Which is a common Old Testament metaphor for obedience to God in following His truth and His righteousness. It was a conscious act on their part. They deliberately left the straight path, the, the way of truth, in order to follow another way. Now that's a sobering, sobering statement because it indicates that they once followed the truth. They sat under the teaching of the Bible. They, they professed to believe it, then abandoned it, apostatized. It happens in a place like this. Peter had seen it. He saw it with Judas, a man he knew and a man he trusted. That's why I said earlier in chapter 1 and verse 10, to be diligent to make God's calling of you sure. These men had not done that. Their profession of faith was not deep. It was not genuine. At some point, they began to drift spiritually. Then they took a different way, a deliberate decision to go a different way, the way of self-gratification. This leads into Peter's final Old Testament character study. Balaam, the prophet who worked for profit, as the commentator Charles Green put it. It's a good way of stating it. The prophet who worked for profit. They chose his way. The result of that was they are lost. Peter says they have gone astray, meaning they have, have taken a way of confusion and ruin. They've gone off into error. They're like Balaam. 
He was a false prophet and is the example of a man who was motivated by greed, by the desire for financial gain, and a man who had a bad end. The account of Balaam is found in Numbers 22 through 25, and then his end is uh, given in chapter 31. As Israel approached the promised land, they camped in Moab, which was across the Jordan River from Jericho. Their presence there frightened the king of Moab, Balak. Israel's numbers were great, and they'd already defeated the Amorite kings Og and Sion. So Balak saw the nation as a threat, and he sent a delegation to Balaam in order to hire him to come and curse Israel. Balaam had a reputation as a man who had uh, powerful magic. So Balaam listened to this proposal, this offer, and initially he refused it. And in the first half of Numbers 22, he seems to be a faithful prophet. The reality is, His refusal was a stall tactic in order to negotiate a better price. God first told him to go, God first told him not to go in verse 12, and then he allowed him to go in verse 20 because it was Balaam's real desire to do that. In his heart, he refused the warning that God gave, and he kept entertaining that offer from these emissaries from Balak. Well, that's what Peter says. He loved the wages of unrighteousness. Money was more important to him than God's command. This is a case of God letting a man follow his desires against God's prescribed or stated will, against God's revelation. And the result would be Balaam's life would be ruined. Still, on the way, God gave the false prophet another warning. Maybe the most unusual warning in all of the Bible when his donkey spoke to him. Balaam was riding along when an angel with a sword in his hand stood in front of them. Balaam couldn't see him. He he was spiritually blind, but the donkey did and tried to avoid the danger. they They were on a narrow path through a vineyard with a wall on either side. So when the donkey moved one direction, Balaam's foot bumped against the wall, angered the prophet. So he struck the donkey. When it happened again, Balaam got very angry and started beating the donkey with a stick. That went on until the donkey spoke and said, what have I done to you? Now, how do we explain that? Uh, Is this proof that the Bible is really a collection of legends or myths like Aesop's fables fables, uh, with, with talking animals? You know, I can imagine that these false teachers liked that passage and they'd point to that passage and say, look at this, uh, a story about uh, an invisible angel with a sword and a donkey that talks. Now, that is just a fable. Not at all. This was a miracle with a lesson. Numbers 22 verse 28 states the reason for the event, and the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. Now, that's unusual. It's supposed to be unusual. But it's not hard for God to do. Nothing's too difficult for the Lord. So it's not unbelievable. It it may be completely out of our experience, and of course it is, but it's not out of the realm of the possible. God can do anything. And in, in one sense, it prefigures what is about to happen. Balaam will give Blessings rather than curses. So just as God can make a donkey speak, He can make a false prophet prophesy. But the incident with the donkey was a rebuke, Peter says. His donkey could see danger that Balaam couldn't see. The animal had more sense 
than the mad prophet. That's what Peter calls him. It, it was only when the Lord opened Balaam's eyes that he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, sword drawn, and then he realized the danger that he was in. Still, he continued with the men of Moab. And in spite of his best efforts, he could only bless Israel rather than curse it. In fact, he gave a great messianic prophecy in Numbers 24, verse 17, of the star coming forth from Jacob. In spite of man's best efforts, God cannot be frustrated. That wasn't the end of the incident. Balaam continued to work against Israel. He, he found a way to get his wages. He tried to corrupt the nation with immorality. He used Midianite women who were neighbors of the Moabites to seduce the men of Israel at a place called Baal Peor. It was an attempt to cause intermarriage with pagan people and and cause Israel to assimilate into Canaanite society. It was wrong. Balaam knew it was wrong, but he did it for money. He did it from greed. It failed, and Balaam suffered the penalty and died by the sword he had avoided earlier. He persisted in sin in spite of the warnings. Balaam's two sins were, he loved money, and he taught God's people to sin. He paid for both. And that's the way of Balaam. It is the way of unbelief. It is the way of self-indulgence. Its end is destruction. What is the point of Peter's illustration? He was encouraging the churches not to be impressed with these false teachers, as clever and charming as they may be. They are no different from Balaam. A dumb donkey had clearer vision than he did. His mind was made mad by his lust for money, and he came to a bad end. So too are these men mad. And so too will they come to a bad end. There is nothing new here. Don't be charmed or beguiled by these kinds of people, Peter is saying. They are well trained in deception. Well, how do we do that? How do we avoid that? How do we apply the lesson that Peter is giving here? Well, first, it's by being aware of the danger, by being aware of the threat that such men pose to us. And secondly, by knowing God's Word. God has not left us unprepared for anything, any contingency, any danger, any threat. He has given us a new nature as believers in Jesus Christ. He has sealed our hearts with the Holy Spirit who is our guide and our enabler. And He's given us the Word of God and eyes to see it and understand it. And we're to equip ourselves with it. It is the safeguard for our lives. It is the unstable who fall. The unstable who are not grounded in the Word of God. Peter knew that well. Peter knew what it was to be unstable and to fall. He, he did that in spite of the Lord's warnings to him. He denied Jesus three times. So he learned the lesson from that that we need to learn, and that is, first of all, to know that we are in and of ourselves weak. We are no match for the devil and his angels. We need to study God's Word. We need to learn its doctrines. And we need to walk with the Lord. We need to walk by the Spirit and not depart from the Word of God or from the Spirit. Well, that happens only by God's grace. But by His grace, we walk wisely and securely. And by His grace and knowledge, we become helpful to others, maybe even helpful to a false teacher. After all, if God could restrain the madness of Balaam, He can use you 
to rebuke and maybe restrain a man in error and even help him by God's grace to turn from his error and to the Lord. Making a dumb donkey speak is no more of a miracle than making me or you speak truth and bring healing light. That's a miracle of God. And He can do it with every one of us. So in these dark days in which we live, in these troubled times in which we live, which needs the light of God's Word, may God make us eager and diligent to know His living Word. And if you who are watching, listening, if any one of you is not a believer yet in Jesus Christ, we call you to Him. He is the living Savior. The eternal Son of God. Very God of very God who became a man in order to die for sinners. Does that seem like madness to you? It's not. It's glory. You need the eyes to see it. So pray for that. Pray that God would open your eyes to see that glory and the truth of it and bring you to faith in Christ. In Him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Him is eternal life that is obtained for all who believe in Him. May God help you to do that. Let's bow in a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless the things that we've considered and prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper that we'll take in just a moment. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for your goodness to us. We live in a dangerous time. And really, there has never been a time since the fall of man that the world hasn't been dangerous for your people. And so we're not living in any kind of unique days. But there are times that need your light, that need the Word of God and need men and women who will stand for you and have the truth, are equipped with that light of your revelation. Help us to be men and women who desire to know your truth. It's the best safeguard for the temptations of this world and for the tempters of this world, the false teachers of this world. Help us to be well girded, to put on the armor of God and and know how to use the sword that you've given us, which is the word of God. Make us useful. Father, we thank You for the death of Your Son, which has made us, who are believers in Jesus Christ, new creatures. We thank You for Him, and as we now prepare to take the Lord's Supper, we pray that You would prepare our hearts for that. And may this be a time of deep reflection and a time of sanctification as we consider the Lord Jesus life and death for us. It's in His name we pray. Amen. Do this in remembrance of me. So said the Lord Jesus when He instituted the Lord's Supper. The last few weeks, uh, Sunday by Sunday, we've had occasion to focus on that idea of remembering and the very idea requires a looking back at what he did for us on the cross. This hymn we just sang uh, speaks to that. But it's also right to say that for us, there ought also to be uh, looking forward when we observe the supper. Jesus made that clear in Luke's account. The Lord speaks of having earnestly desired to eat this Passover with his disciples before he suffered because, he said, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And Matthew records how he said, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So our Lord himself uh, had his eye on the future as he pondered the present and what he was soon to endure. I don't know if you're like me, but in the earliest days of this COVID pandemic that we've been enduring, I noticed 
this persistent and ongoing urge within to fast forward to the next day, uh, to the next week, uh, to turn the corner and discover uh, what the future held for us. I discovered this inner urge uh, pulling me to get from where we were to where we are going, which I think we all have confidence is a better place. So in that sense, uh, what we've been going through and what we've been feeling can be seen as figurative to a more profound looking forward, uh, not just to a better place, but to the better place, to a kingdom. It's the kingdom of the king of kings, and it will be inhabited and filled with uh, the king's own people. Jesus said, I will drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Our weekly observances of the Lord's Supper and the observances of the church uh, for centuries uh, past uh, will one day culminate in a celebration of the messianic reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. There will be no social distancing there, no live streaming there, but love and submission and the society of the Lord's redeemed. I mentioned uh, the little booklet that Dr. Johnson wrote on the Lord's Supper. It's an excellent uh, study, and many of you have it, I know, in your homes. Uh, but in it, Dr. Johnson borrowed uh, quite a bit from Alexander McLaren, uh, the 19th century Scottish Baptist pastor and commentator who had much to say about the Lord's Supper. And here is McLaren on that looking forward aspect of the Lord's Supper. If dying, Jesus left such a commentary upon his act as this ordinance affords, then he cannot have done with the world. Then the powers that were set in motion by his death cannot pause or cease their action until they have reached their appropriate culmination in effecting all that was in them to effect. If leaving his people, Jesus said to them, never forget my death for you, my broken body, my, my shed blood. He therein said that the time will come, must come, when all the powers of the cross shall be incorporated in humanity and when the parted shall be reunited. When the parted shall be reunited. One day the parted shall be reunited. I know we all feel that in our own hearts, that inner urge uh, to turn the corner and be back together, congregated where we're accustomed to congregating, but to today connected to some degree, uh, rather by the World Wide Web. So we look forward to that day, but more, uh, we look forward to the day Jesus looked to, as again, we partake of the bread and wine that he set before his disciples, remembering and looking back to the person and work that they symbolize while anticipating his second coming, knowing that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so as we observe the ordin ordinance today, we say in our hearts, come, Lord Jesus. And until he comes in obedience to his command, we do do this in remembrance of him. He purchased the forgiveness of our sins by paying for them by dying for them upon the cross. And that's what we have the privilege now to remember. He took the bread. He said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Afterward, he took the cup. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let me now give thanks for the bread. Father, we're so thankful uh, because we are sinners. We do need forgiveness. Uh, we are uh, like Balaam in our hearts. We are like these false teachers apart from the grace that you have uh, poured into our lives, apart from the fact that you opened up our hearts to 
uh, give us the gift of faith to receive this gift of salvation, forgiveness uh, that the Lord Jesus accomplished. We're mindful now that he established this ordinance and we are obeying him. Uh, he said, do this, and we are doing it, and we're doing it with grateful hearts. We pray in his name. Amen. <clears throat> Sacrifice of Christ is not only reason to look to the future, as Mark has reminded us, and have hope, but also reason to look at the present and live holy lives. We see that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. That's what I'm going to consider for the next few moments. <clears throat> Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, 17 that if we can call God Father, then we ought to live a godly life. He said, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. Not abject fear, of course, but reverence and sobriety, li living in obedience. Then as further motivation to do that, Peter states the, the great price that was paid in order for us to have the inestimable privilege of having a father-son, father-daughter, father-child relationship with God Almighty. We are, we are to live with godly fear knowing what it costs the Father to gain that for us. Knowing, verse 18, that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life. Literally, that's out of your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Redeemed means ransomed or purchased. It was used of the price paid to buy a slave out of bondage and give him or her freedom. Well, that's what the Father did for us. He redeemed us. He bought us out of a futile life of slavery to sin and a life of a doomed existence, not with the, the greatest riches that we can imagine, gold or diamonds, but something infinitely greater in value, and that is blood. The blood of God's own Son. That means He brought us into a new life of freedom and glory of purity through the sacrificial slaughter of His own Son, though He was innocent and undeserving of death. But that was the only currency that could buy our freedom because it is precious priceless blood of infinite value since it is the blood of the God-man. Remembering that should affect our conduct. God, our, God is our Father, not our judge, because He made Himself the judge of His own Son in our place. Let's give thank, thanks for the cup that speaks of this precious blood of the Lamb. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this cup of wine that speaks to us of the blood of Your Son shed on our behalf, the atonement that was made that we might be right with You, our sins be forgiven, our righteousness your righteousness made our righteousness, clothed in righteousness. Father, we thank You for all that You did for us at the cross. Thank You for Christ. Thank You for His death for us. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. That concludes our service again this Sunday morning. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank You for this time together in this unusual way. And pray that uh, very soon we can come back together in person and fill this room with our presence and, and you 
fill it with your presence as well. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to read and study your word, and we thank you for the privilege of being able to observe the Lord's Supper. We pray that the things we have done will have a good result and effect upon our hearts. And so, Father, build us up in the faith and protect us in the week to come. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Until next week, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith.